All right, thank you for joining us tonight for the webinar on robotic assisted joint replacement surgery um, presented by Dr. Lewis Corrales, the director of the revived joint replacement program here at Casa Colina. Before Dr. Corrales begins his talk, we'd like to remind you that there will be a question and answer session at the end. Please feel free to submit your questions as the presentation is occurring and we'll get to as many of them as possible at the end. And with that, Dr. Corrales. All right, thank you. Um... My apologies, this is the first time uh, doing social media. Usually we do this in person. Surprisingly, it's a little bit more nerve-wracking. Uh, we've done a series in the, in the past uh, talks. Uh, obviously with COVID, I was kind of put on hold and now we're, we're restarting the series. Uh, I'm doing this talk, maybe some other surgeons are gonna join in. Uh, today's talk uh, is about robotic-assisted uh, joint replacement surgery. Um, I'm gonna talk about both knees and hips. Um, I'm also gonna give you an overview of just, you know, what joint replacement surgery is, uh, expectations, pain management. Uh, we'll focus on the technology and the uh, surgical technique, but uh, we also wanna give you a broader stroke in terms of what the surgery entails preoperatively, intraoperatively, after surgery. Uh, this is a quote that I like a lot from uh, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, the best way to predict the future is to create it. And when this program started here at Casa Colina Hospital, uh, we wanted to create a program that allowed us to uh, bring in uh, well-rounded individuals to help us uh, get people through surgery and have a great experience and also have great outcomes. Um, typically those things don't happen by accident. You got to be actively involved to create uh, such a program and we're really proud of what we've done. Uh, we work with really outstanding people, some of which I'll mention as we move forward. But really uh, what we want to offer patients is not just the surgery. We want to offer them a continuum of care, the whole thing, meaning uh, preoperative uh, evaluation and making sure they're safe for surgery and empowering the patient to understand what's going to happen and what to expect, obviously a high level of surgical uh, technique and, um, and post-operatively a, a rapid recovery and a lot of support. Uh, this is a big event in someone's life and we want to make sure that we encompass the whole thing. Uh, you know, our, our saying for our program here is move towards a better life. And we can't forget the big picture because, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, surgery, it's not a two-day recovery. Uh, it is a journey, it is a process, but once we see it through, you know, the big picture really is uh, ending up with a better quality of life and uh, not just through function, but less pain and, and just more uh, enjoyment from day to day, not having to suffer uh, from the debilitating uh, effects of arthritis. These are some of our patients, uh, you know, we gear them up in these t-shirts uh, with the name of our program kind of our model, and we want to maintain a, a atmosphere of positivity, because at the end, like I said, this is a positive thing. There may be some hard days that follow surgery, but overall in the end, uh, it is, uh, our goal is that it's a positive experience and that your life is changed in a positive way. And we really try to push that philosophy through, you know, my staff, me, uh, our therapist, and everybody that's involved with patients. Um, in order to get a good outcome, it isn't just surgery, and it isn't just robotics, and it isn't just you know the, the latest and greatest. It's really a well-rounded approach. And so if you look at this pie, I mean, surgery is part of the pie, um, but you also have nursing here, you have anesthesia, you have rehab, patient selection, you know, education, pain management, and it's really the, the culmination of all these things coming together to, to give you a good result. Um, so this program that we've established here now going on I think more than five years, uh, some of the pillars of the program are to uh, educate and empower patients to medically optimize patients and reduce risk before surgery, incorporate uh, less invasive techniques and technology to help us improve our outcomes, um, and also use outcomes data, meaning uh, we do track our patients and we want to see that our interventions are indeed helping us uh, get a better outcome and helping us make decisions. Uh, we can't talk about surgery without talking about post-surgical pain. Uh, most people probably have this in mind when they think about a knee replacement or a hip replacement. 
And sadly, in the past, perhaps that was more the case. Um, fear still remains the most frequent reason people uh, hold off on surgery. Um, so they're in a lot of pain, but they're so afraid of the, sur the pain after surgery that they're willing to live with pain because of that. So it's definitely something that's very important for us to address. And that was one of the main things we wanted to work on. As you know, pain is complicated. It's an emotion. It varies between people. People handle pain differently, um, cope with pain differently. And so it is at times a moving target. But we spend a lot of time on trying to figure out ways to reduce pain. Um, in the past, I think, you know, maybe we didn't do a good job in terms of preparing people for surgery, patient selection and screening. Uh, uh, anesthesia certainly has come a long way. Uh, the way we handle the soft tissues, the muscles, the skin, the way we do the surgery is less invasive now, and we try to provide uh, you know, a tremendous amount of support. So I think setting appropriate expectations is important. Um, you know, we still haven't figured out a way to make pain zero, but mild, at times moderate, is kind of our goal. We're trying to avoid uh, severe pain. Uh, we want to identify factors. Uh, every person is different. And so we want to identify factors that are unique to you that may uh, influence your perception of pain. We want to prepare you for surgery. We want to use multiple modalities to treat pain, not just rely on narcotics. Uh, obviously, we want to incorporate uh, less invasive techniques. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, robotic surgery in terms of uh, that particular uh, point there and a lot of support. Things to consider as a patient, uh, cycle, your uh, mental state of mind is important. If you deal with anxiety, you have stress, you're depressed, these are things that uh, are important to deal with before surgery and that we have appropriate coping mechanisms. Uh, support at home is very important. In fact, all our patients have to have a coach at home. We call them a coach, but someone at home that's going to give them uh, support, uh, not just physically, but also emotionally. Uh, we want to be aware of, of uh, you know, if you've been dealing with chronic pain uh, from other areas of your body, uh, fibromyalgia, smoking, obesity is a big one. Uh, sometimes if uh, you, you have advanced age, you may not be able to tolerate certain pain medications. So we have to uh, figure out other uh, creative ways to deal with pain or if you can't take uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Uh, Education and empowerment, that's another big pillar of this program. Uh, here is Susie Johnson, she's our paid care coordinator, and her uh, objective here is to connect with you early, to form a relationship with you, and to guide you through the whole process from start to finish. Uh, she's in constant communication with patients. Uh, people call her directly through her phone. Uh, we also have STAR, a nurse practitioner, who manages patients medically on the floor after surgery and once they go home. Uh, we have Cynthia Lopez, my nurse practitioner in my own practice, who helps with preoperative uh, screening and, and assessment, getting patients ready for surgery. There's a, a class that all patients uh, are required to take. Uh, oftentimes, we just don't have enough time in clinic to go over all the finer details of, of surgery and what to expect, and equipment and physical therapy and all the things that go along with this. So uh, we're, we're really trying to get um, help people get to the point where at the time of surgery, they really don't, there isn't any mystery. They know what's going to happen. And so we're trying to eliminate that fear of the unknown, which I think is important. Uh, medical optimization is really important. We, we're uh, better off avoiding complications than dealing with complications. Uh, two big ones here in this community are obesity and diabetes. Um, and so we do follow guidelines um, to try to help figure out what patients may be at risk and try to help them uh, reduce that risk in terms of obesity, in terms of uh, uncontrolled diabetes, if they're anemic, if they're smoking, these are things that can be addressed and improved before surgery. It can really go a long way to avoid complications. When we looked at our numbers, and I haven't looked at them recently, but in 2017, more than half of our patients were obese and more than half of our patients had diabetes. So these are two big targets that we've been working to try to uh, really make a, an impact in the community. Uh, one of the big things uh, is how we treat pain. And I'd say today the most common way to do this is by uh, using a multi-pronged approach, often called a multimodal pain uh, regimen. Uh, what this means is that uh, when you look at how pain is processed, uh, we have the surgical area and 
without a doubt, surgery is controlled tissue trauma, right? We're cutting into the body, we're dissecting in the body, and that's going to trigger a response from the body, which ultimately triggers pain. That response is conveyed to the brain via nerves in our spinal cord up to the brain. Brain processes that information, says, what is going on here? And then all of a sudden, pain is sensed. When you look at this pathway, uh, really, uh, the main thing I want you to get out of this is that we can intervene at multiple levels. We can use medications to uh, help reduce pain at the level of, of the brain where it's being processed, at the level of the spinal cord where it's being relayed, and at the level of the soft tissues where it's being generated. And we'll kind of go through these steps. Um, I'd say today the gold standard in terms of an anesthetic plan uh, for these type of surgeries is, is using axial anesthesia or regional anesthesia. What that means is that we're doing a spinal block uh, and or a regional block. Um, once we do that, we're blocking the signal of pain reaching your brain, which is nice because once you're in surgery, your brain doesn't actually know that we're operating. And so you're in a very peaceful state. We can do things at the local level during the surgery to help minimize inflammation and pain. Um, and so we're trying to uh, address pain um, at the area of the surgery, at the area of relay in the spine, and at the area of processing at the brain. And you can see the different medication, not just opioids that have an effect at these three levels. And so we're really trying to affect uh, control pain at, at three levels, not just one. This is something that we started using, I want to say maybe a little bit over a year ago. It's a form of a nerve block where we freeze the um, sensory nerves to the knee. And the effect can be long lasting, anywhere from six to 12 weeks, much longer than when we do a nerve block with uh, lidocaine or, or uh, a medication. Um, it's a form of cryotherapy. Cryotherapy is something that's been around for a long time, going all the way back to 400 BC. People uh, figured out that if you put uh, ice or something cold in an area that was inflamed or painful, it helped reduce the pain. Simple concept, but now we're trying to apply that to helping us with uh, blocking a nerve and helping uh, reduce the sensation of pain without reducing strength, which is important. Uh, when you look at the knee, there's two uh, branches, sensory branches that we try to address, uh, one that comes in from the top of the knee and one that comes in from the inner portion across the knee. Uh, we use this uh, machine that's got three little prongs on it. Um, it's got a, a cartridge here that freezes the tips of these three little prongs. And so when that happens, uh, the traverse, traversing nerves uh, get frozen. And when they're frozen, they don't conduct the signal of pain. And so essentially, we're, we're turning down the volume of pain from the knee. And that can last anywhere from six to 12 weeks, which is nice because that gets us through a good portion of your recovery. Um, I'm not going to play the video because it's not a, a great video. I need to hire someone to follow me around, um, I think. But uh, this is marking out where those sensory nerves come in from the top here in the thigh and then from this inner portion of the knee. We use this little machine. We poke it through the skin, hold it there for about a minute, and we just work our way, our, our way down the uh, these two areas until we finish. Um, typically, uh, we use a little bit of local anesthetic here. Patient, you know, we're talking, conversing, and right after we're done, a uh, person is up and moving. Maybe I'll skip here to the end, but this... Uh, Uh, this patient here just had the procedure done and she's moving around um, right away. Uh -oh. So maybe the videos may not work, but we'll see. All right, this is a, another intervention that we uh, has become pretty standard now with knee replacement surgery. It's called a periarticular injection. And, and what we do here, let's see if this works, uh, is that we use a local anesthetic and in surgery, this is a knee replacement. Um, we've done all our, our bony work here. This is right before we put the final implant in and we're injecting in the back of the knee in the capsule. Um, there's a high percentage of pain receptors in the back of the knee. So we're trying to infiltrate that area with local anesthetic all along the edges of the bone where there's also a lot of pain receptors and in the subcutaneous tissue. And so in this way, we're trying to control pain at the level uh, at the, at the origin, this person's already gotten a spinal anesthetic, so they're nice and comfortable. And so, uh, and you've received medications um, that help 
at the level of processing. So all three levels are encompassed kind of in that video. This is where we kind of segued into the robotic surgery. This is a system that we use here, the Stryker Mako system, essentially a big computer with a robotic arm, different attachments, depending on the type of surgery that we're gonna do. Um, we went over the fact that uh, joint replacement surgery in general is on the rise, not on the not on decline. Um, up to 20% of patients after uh, total knee replacement surgery can report dissatisfaction with the results. Um, Arthritis is, uh, it's a spectrum, right? So some patients have arthritis in one portion of their knee. Others patients may have more diffuse arthritis. And having the ability to address uh, the problem in a variety of ways, I think, uh, is important from a partial knee replacement all the way to a total knee replacement. Um, in this case, uh, we see up to 30% of patients having isolated uh, inner compartment arthritis and the rest of the knee is in good condition. These patients, um, in my opinion, are good candidates for partial knee replacement, uh, which we know offers some advantages, quicker recovery, shorter stay in the hospital, typically better function, and typically a better feel, a better functional feel. So for someone uh, amendable for a partial knee replacement, they may find this more satisfying than a total knee replacement. Um, this is what a partial knee replacement looks like. This is a patient after surgery where we replace just one compartment of the knee leaving the rest uh, as it was. Uh, the same way this is planned is similar between a partial and a total knee, meaning first uh, we get a CT scan of the knee. That CT scan is then used to make a three-dimensional model of the knee. We virtually perform the surgery ahead of time. Um, so uh, this is in the computer simulation. The green is where the problem is and where we're putting the implant. So we're able to place the implant, the implant very precisely uh, where we want it in terms of orientation and size. And so at the time of surgery, we're, we already have all this information, which helps us uh, make better decisions intraoperatively. Uh, this is a, a patient of mine, a 40-year-old, uh, I think he was an electrician, active guy, liked surfing. He previously had seen uh, someone else who recommended a total knee replacement. He didn't feel he was ready for that. When we saw him, uh, we felt that he was a, a very reasonable candidate for partial knee replacement. He was um, much more uh, excited about that option, being more preserving. Uh, this is uh, the preoperative plan. Uh, once again, we can see that we're performing the surgery ahead of time, placing the implant um, ahead of time, uh, getting our orientation, our sizes, how the implant's going to fit in the knee before we even do the surgery. Uh, this is his surgery, or sorry, this is his knee before surgery. This is after. We can see the area that was replaced. These two X-rays are a little bit different, um, but I think it conveys the idea. Uh, we preserved, uh, you know, the rest of his knee. We we focused here on just the uh, inner aspect of the knee. Um, these are uh, two patients had a partial knee replacement. Uh, this young lady here, around the same age, uh, similar situation. Majority of our partial knee replacements, pretty much all our partial knee replacements go home the same day, just like this lady. She went home the same day. In fact, a lot of patients are going home the same day now, even after it's been hip and knee replacement. Uh, this is that gentleman we saw his x ray. I want to say this is about, there you go, two months. Um, I think if I, if I was a lawyer, I'd probably be accused of leading the witness here. But um, the point is that uh, in the right patient doing a partial knee replacement, I think may may uh, I think these patients were definitely more happy with a partial knee replacement than a total knee replacement. Um, so this is a, a the total knee replacement. Um, 
part of the system. Uh, this came out in 2017, and we've been doing these since then. Uh, so it's about four years now. Um, the idea here is very similar. So CT scan, 3D, 3D model of the knee. Uh, we're able to place the implant. Here you'll notice that the implant covers the entire surface of the femur and the tibia uh, because it's a total knee replacement as opposed to just a partial knee replacement. We're able to change alignment and configuration, get all this information ahead of time. Um, uh, this is one of our patients uh, the next morning after surgery, um, feeling pretty good. And overall, I mean, uh, you know, we want patients to, to feel good and motivated uh, because of the work uh, doesn't all happen in surgery, right? After surgery, you got to work on your motion, you got to work on your strength, you got to work on your gait, you know, and all that takes time and effort. And so um, he went home that day. These were his x-rays before surgery. This is his knee replacement. Uh, this is intraoperatively. Uh, these are the sensors that the robot uses to figure out where the knee is in space and the limb. We've done all our bony cuts here and we're ready to put in the implant. Uh, this is, in this particular case, we use an implant that was non-cemented. Uh, it's 3D printed. The bone grows onto the implant. Uh, I think this is a very good option for patients of good bone quality. Um, the idea with this biologic Fixation is that over time, if there's an issue with the connection between the implant and the bone, your body can repair that. As opposed to when we use bone cement, when the bone cement fails, then the whole implant can fail. Um, I'm not gonna, it just shows him walking the morning after surgery. Let's see. And uh, he went home that morning. And he was a pretty happy camper. All right, maybe if I hit the down arrow, we'd be okay. Uh, this is a patient here. Um, we, we found a way from a bilateral to knee replacements since with newer uh, data showing a little bit higher risk of complication. In this case, uh, you're well following your bilateral knee replacements. Now keep in mind, uh, just like everything, right? People, patients, uh, we come in a variety of uh, you know sizes and different factors that influence our recovery. Um, we always strive to achieve this here, um, but everybody's different, and people's experience may be different. But you know, this is our goal here, and I think we achieve that with the majority of patients. Um, Let's see. There we go. Um, these are other patients uh, after surgery uh, the next morning or the same day of surgery, uh, knee replacement patients, hip replacement patients. This board here is where we um, put how much everybody walks before they go home. Uh, everybody walks the day of surgery and we kind of track it here so you can see your progress. We try to incorporate family members into the discharge planning, into the therapy. Uh, at lunch, uh, really try to make it a, uh, a positive experience, uh, a family experience. Um, we're gonna turn our attention uh, towards uh, hip replacement, um, surgery, um, outside of just technology, one of the biggest advancements for hip replacement surgery is really the approach uh, to surgery, going towards a more muscle sparing approach. Uh, the gold standard approach to the hip remains the posterior approach. And this is a traditional posterior approach. This is a uh, less invasive muscle sparing approach. We'll work primarily through the glute muscle. We don't go into the IT band and we preserve all the major muscles uh, inside the hip. The anterior approach, similar idea. The lateral approach, similar idea. I always tell patients, don't pick an approach, pick a surgeon because uh, if, if a certain individual doesn't get good outcomes, regardless of their approach, you may not be happy with the results of your surgery. 
Um, oftentimes, a lot of patients hyper focus on the length and the size of their incision. And I'll, I'll say this now, and I'll always say this: it, it, the size of the incision gives you no indication of the quality of the work. Um, what matters is what is done deep. And in fact, uh, from our own experience, once we get too small with our incision, it can create problems in terms of skin uh, healing issues because a very tiny incision means you have to pull a lot of traction on the, on the skin and subcutaneous tissue. And when you traumatize the tissue, uh, you can get more pain, you can get more bruising, more swelling, and, and the wound can have trouble healing. So, you know, there is a point here where you can go too small. And, and if you're a big person, a tall person, you're going to get a little bit bigger incision. But I'd say the average incision uh, probably is around six to eight inches. It's a little bit on the smaller side. Once we go through the skin, we go through the gluteal muscle, which you can kind of see here. We remove the bursa over the hip. We preserve the piriformis, one of the main uh, hip abductor, uh, sorry, one of the main uh, external rotators of the hip. We released a short external rotator here. We've opened the capsule. We can see the neck of the femur. We can see the head of the femur. Here's a socket. And essentially, we're going to work inside of this window. And uh, I don't know if it's hard to appreciate, but that's a pretty small window. Before this uh, approach was more extensive, I went all the way down here. We released all the muscles from uh, the proximal femur all the way up here. This muscle was released, and all the muscles down here were released. You had a beautiful view. You can see everything. But the more muscles you release uh, can affect stability and obviously can affect recovery because you have to repair all those muscles, you have to heal. Um, the other thing this does is it makes the surgery more challenging. And I think this is where uh, technology comes in to help us improve our uh, accuracy as we're trying to work through a very small window. Um, this is after the hip replacement has been placed. Essentially, that is the same view you had before, right, where we saw the femoral neck. Now this is the stem with the new neck. We see the new femoral head made out of ceramic. We see the edge of the cup here. We see the muscle still attached. Um, the gluteal muscles are spread apart. This is the uh, capsule with the attached ex little external rotator muscle here. We're going to close that flap here, repair it. And then once we do that, it's like we were never there. The gluteal muscle just falls back together. We close just this uh, fascia over the muscle, and then we close the skin. And in that way, we're working through muscles, around muscles, really not releasing any major muscles here, a much smaller approach. Um, this is currently the system that I use. Uh, it is a form of robotic surgery, but it's different in that we're not using a robotic arm to come here and assist us. We're placing uh, the trial implant here. Uh, let me orient you here. So here we're looking, uh, the patient is on their side. This is their back. This is their buttock. This is their leg. Here's the incision for the uh, hip replacement. We have retractors in here. This handle here is curved because before this incision extended further, and so you can use a straight um, instrument here. We can't do that. We have to use special uh, minimally invasive instruments as so curved uh, to allow us to fit into the smaller uh, work area. On here, there's a sensor with three, uh, with uh, four um, prongs here. This camera, uh, we put two small pins into the pelvis, and so the camera is secured onto these pins. And this camera then is able to triangulate the coordinates of the position of the cup based on the position of these uh, sensors here. And so what this does is that in surgery, I have actual information that helps me decide if I like the placement of the cup, if I need to readjust it. Traditionally, this is done by uh, putting on a guide here, which is uh, sort of a rod. And that rod, I just look at it with my eyes and I say, you know, that looks pretty level, that looks pretty good, but I don't have any quantitative measures like I do here. So here, this is telling me the coordinates of the cup. Um, also tells me how much we've lengthened the leg, how much tension we've added to the hip. Uh, gives us a little bit of the position of the patient if they're rotated uh, forward. This patient's rotated about six degrees forward, which doesn't uh, affect the measurements um, significantly, but if it was more, then we would have to readjust the position real quick. 
Um, and so this information is live in surgery. It helps me decide if I like the placement of the cup, if that seems appropriate, and then uh, before we put the final implant. Uh, this is a patient, uh, uh, I think I think I posted a video of him on YouTube. He's a pretty funny guy, but um, we've done both his hips uh, replacements at this point. I think this is maybe the I think we did the left side at this surgery here. Uh, this is him the next morning um, going through our little physical therapy gauntlet here, doing stairs, um, looking pretty bored, which is not a bad thing. That means things are going well. There's another patient about a week surgery. I think this is showed up to the therapy appointment. I will say, uh, you know, I wasn't too happy that he should look like a walker, even though he's walking great. I, I want patients to uh, use the walker for the first week until they meet their therapist. Obviously, he didn't listen to me too well, but he was doing pretty well. Um, oftentimes people want to know what their incision is going to look like and I mean these are some pictures of some pretty good looking incisions that have healed nicely we do everything we can to try to achieve a nice looking cosmetic uh, a, a nice cosmetic look after surgery um, but again, people sometimes heal differently. You know, darker skin individuals can sometimes form a thicker scar. Uh, even with knee replacements, just like the hip, if we make the incision too small, then we can create other issues. And so there is a point here where going smaller creates more problems. And oftentimes extending the incision a little bit can go a long way to avoid wound healing problems. And so although everybody wants a tiny incision, sometimes it's not in our best interest but we do everything we can to make sure the, the incision heals nicely for you. Um, following surgery, uh, you know, the goal of, of the surgery, if we do things right, is that you wake up in good spirits, pain is controlled, you have enough energy to get up and walk, and for the most part, everybody walks the day of surgery, and then we get you home uh, within typically a 24-hour time frame. Um, the shift has now become to recover from home. And so our job is to try to give you the tools and do things in a way that allow you to mobilize quickly and recover from home. Um, data across multiple fields shows that the longer people stay in the hospital, the higher the rates of complications. Obviously there's a balance. We never wanna send a patient home who's not ready. And so we do follow pretty strict criteria, but essentially, uh, you know, if you're walking around safely, pain is controlled, you're medically good, you know, you're, you're avoiding uh, your eating, you're feeling uh, good, then at that point, not in pain, you're not sick, you're not um, immobile, and so um, you don't have to be in a hospital, and that's really the goal. When we look at some of our pain scores, uh, what we see here is that when you get to the floor, average person rates their pain under two. At about 12 hours, it tends to dip a little bit, and at the time of discharge, usually around 24 hours, the variability here is pretty minimal. Our initial goal was kind of a pain score of four, and this is kind of that visual score that most hospitals use, you know, zero to 10. Um, you know, kind of the goal has been to keep pain sort of in this middle area. We're trying to avoid this area here. Uh, what I've seen is that um, based on everything we do in, in surgery, before surgery, um, pain can be pretty minimal the first three days and it does go up a little bit around that third or fourth day as some of these interventions start to wear off and then we got to rely just on some common sense taking our time treating the uh, swelling using ice following a pain schedule and not overdoing it which I think is the big one oftentimes patients feel really good they go home they don't take anything for pain they're walking around all day they're just bragging to everybody how great they feel and then that third or fourth day comes and that pain really hits them because you know they've been off of any medication now for a couple of days they've been overdoing it and uh, we really try to coach them to to avoid that scenario when you go home take your time healing is not just activity it's also how you eat how you sleep how you deal with stress how you manage your pain you know um, manage your activity 
And so those are important aspects to keep in mind. Also, the length of stay, how long you're in the hospital has drastically changed. At least when I started seven, seven years ago, um, I want to say the average length of stay was about three days, which was better from five days before that and better from eight days before that. And so over time, we're seeing this trend uh, continue to work its way down. Currently, we're at about uh, 24 hours or less. Partial knees typically go home the same day, but we're seeing now a higher percentage of patients going home the same day after hip and knee replacements as well. And by far, the, the discharge now is, has changed. Um, very, min, very small amount of patients go to a skilled nursing facility or, or to acute rehab. Majority patients go home. I think this data here is when we started our program, 83% um, was, was great. Um, when we looked at our numbers uh, last year and this year, we're, we're discharging patients home at an even higher clip, almost 100% for our total knees, above 90% for our total hips. Uh, this is, these aren't just my results. These are all the surgeons uh, who uh, work here in our program. And so that trend continues to improve. Spend a lot of time trying to make sure people are happy. Obviously, we can make everybody happy, but you know, so far we've been pretty successful. Over 90% of patients um, rate their experience, you know, nine out of 10 or 10 out of 10. Um, feeling prepared for surgery is a big one. Uh, over 90% of patients feel they were prepared for surgery. Complications uh, in the hospital, less than 1% across the board. Majority of people are walking greater than 300 feet by the time they're, they're going home. So that's within 24 hours, typically bending their knee about 90 degrees or a little bit more than that within 24 hours. And these are all very good markers indicating that patients are comfortable, they're motivated, uh, pain is controlled, surgery went well. We like getting messages from patients, you know, with uh, laughing emojis instead of, you know, angry emojis. The idea here is that when you go home, you're feeling pretty good. Once you're home, then um, you, you control your destiny, right? You're in charge of managing your pain, of doing the right things. We're there to coach you. And so we got to work together on that. Um, but to kind of wrap things up, um, I think equally important, if not more important, to using technology and all these uh, techniques that we just went over is really having a well-rounded program and approach to patient care. Um, without that, doesn't matter if you use uh, robotics or anything else, you're, you're likely not going to have the same level of success. Robotic surgery can definitely help improve um, your accuracy, how precise you are in surgery, especially when you're using uh, uh, less invasive techniques where you're working through smaller surgical windows. I think um, this technology really lends so well for that. It can help reduce pain along with all the other modalities we talked about. And certainly the ultimate goal is to improve recovery. And that's all I got for you. So happy to uh, take any questions and kind of wrap things up. Here's some contact information, but mostly you can you know go on our Facebook page or uh, Costa web page and um, find our contact information. Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you, Dr. Corrales. We did get a few questions that came in, but um, you answered the majority of did them I? during all your right. presentation. Good job. So good, good job. job. Good job to me. Um, here's one though. Um, I'm not sure if it was covered or not. If it was, I apologize, I missed it. But how mm -hmm. long will the prosthesis last? So the uh, previously we used to quote 15 to 20 years. That's with the uh, previous generation implants. Uh, I'm talking about knee replacements. Um, the newer generation implants, uh, in theory, should last beyond that, 20 plus years, potentially closer to what currently. Um, we quote for hip replacements, which for a hip replacement, sometimes uh, we can even see survival up to 30 years. Um, and the reason for that is improvement in uh, the quality, I shouldn't say the quality, but the materials that are being used, the way we do the implants, and also um, the type of fixation that we use, uh, trying to use biologic fixation in some patients where it makes sense. Um, but overall, I'd say, you know, potentially 20 plus years. Um, you also have to consider that once the implants are in your body, you also play a role in determining the longevity of those implants, meaning that 
you know, uh, your he- your health is important, your weight is important, uh, how much load or stress you put on those joints is important. So you have a significant de- decline in your health um, that can certainly uh, create a problem such as a, an infection years down the road, which would mean the implant has to come out. Um, if you're significantly overweight, it can cause the implant to loosen early or fail early, and there's reasonable data supporting that. Um, and also the amount of stress, right? I'll, oftentimes people ask me, can I run? Can I jump? Can I do karate with my replacements? The, the answer to that is physically you will be able to do all those things. But from a common sense perspective, you know, you got to consider is it is it worth the risk? Is it worth doing these high impact things if it may mean that your implant wears out earlier? And so those are the kind of things that you also have to consider. Um, if the surgery is done well, implant was appropriate, accurately placed. Um, after that, you also play a role in, in the longevity. Okay, great. Um, and again, you answered the second question, of, which was about playing sports after robotic assisted surgery. Um, so we'll move on to how can I get a consultation with you? Yeah, before we move on, I mean, a, a lot of patients um, are very active, right? And so, you know, a, a lot of patients play golf and they play, you know, um, uh, racquetball and, and, and tennis. And, and I think you can still play a, a good amount of sports, but you have to be reasonable, right? You, you got to weigh the pros and the cons and, you know, um, decide if it's, if it's worth the risk. Um, I, I'd say for the majority of things, you probably don't have to stress too much about it. But, you know, if you want to go downhill skiing, if you want to jump out of a plane, you want to go bungee jumping, you want to race horses or motorcycles, you can physically do those things, but you got to consider, is it worth the risk? Because if you fall on that implant, you can, you know, get a, a pretty bad fracture, you can get a dislocation, you can significantly damage the implant. And uh, revision surgery, the results are never as good as the first time around. And so those are factors you got to consider. But, but yeah, I mean, a lot of patients play golf and other things. I think within reason, you can probably do a, a, a lot. You just consider those factors, I'd say. Um, what was the question? Uh, how can somebody get a consult, get a consult with us? Uh, you can call my office directly. Um, we have a website you can go to. There's contact information through the website or phone number. You can also reach out to Casa Colina Hospital. They can direct you to our clinic. Um, we have a clinic here on campus uh, right next to the urgent care. Uh, we also have a clinic in Ratu Cucamonga at the Millican uh, Medical Building uh, there. Um, but I'd say probably the easiest way is just to go to our website. All, all our contact information and directions are on there or through the Cost Cleaner website. Great. Um, we did get one more question come in. Can you eventually kneel after an implant or can you cross your legs? That's a good question. So um, you, can, you can kneel, you can cross your legs. Uh, with knee replacements, uh, a decent percentage of patients, although they can physically kneel, don't find it comfortable. That's pretty common. Um, you can get some numbness on the lateral uh, outer aspect of your incision. Um, that's also very common. Um, so yeah, physically you can kneel, but, uh, you may not find it comfortable. So I'm always very upfront with patients, especially if you work, uh, you know, um, doing a job where you have to be on your knees, like laying tile or certain kind of construction type of jobs. And so it's important to have that conversation ahead of time. Um, otherwise, if those expectations aren't set and after surgery, patient wasn't aware of something like that, then they may come to your office unhappy because they're, they're having trouble kneeling or they don't find it comfortable. I think if, if we're up front, uh, we try to anticipate, you know, uh, questions and things. Um, I think we encompass most. Um, but yeah, kneeling is a pretty common question. Uh, you can kneel, uh, but um, a decent percentage of patients don't find that comfortable, and that's across the board. Um, Jeff is asking, how long before a typical patient um, can return to an office job? Uh, for office work, um, I usually say between six and eight weeks. Um, could be sooner than that, could be later than that. It depends on your recovery and how you're doing. Um, I've never had a patient rush back to work and tell me that it was a good decision. And so I always tell patients, you know, take more time than you need. 
um, block out more time than you think. This isn't a race. We want to do things right because if we do, then you get through your recovery and you move on with your life instead of dealing with issues or your recovery being prolonged. You got to understand that with work, once you go back to work, uh, you introduce stress, you introduce limitations to your time. Um, most employers are not going to want you on certain medications that maybe you may still need to help you with your pain. You may be sitting for prolonged periods of time, which can cause swelling and, and other issues that we want to avoid. And so you got to consider all these things, you know, and I always tell patients, make sure you pick a time that, that allows you to step away and focus on your recovery. Two months are very critical. You know, if, uh, if you're on a time crunch, probably not the best time to have the surgery. Um, in addition to that, keep in mind also your nutrition, your sleep, all these other things are very important. Oftentimes you overlook that, but you know, if you're stressed out because of work, because of other factors, you're not eating right, you're not sleeping. Well, guess what? You're not going to feel well. Your knee's not going to perform well and your recovery is going to be affected. So these are things you got to think about. Give yourself ample time. Office job though, I'd say, um, you know, six to eight weeks, but I always say, leave yourself some wiggle room. Okay. Um, well, that concludes um, the questions that we had for our question and answer session. If you have any additional questions or would like more information, um, this presentation will be um, on our YouTube page in the next few days. So you can go back and reference that. You can also contact us through our website or contact Dr. Corrales's office directly as well. Again, thank you, Dr. Corrales, and thank you all for joining us. Have a good evening. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.